All right, uh, it's one o'clock Eastern, so let's get started. Um, got quite the agenda today of things I'd like to talk about. Um, and as people continue to join, then uh, uh, we can kind of get them involved. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to uh, talk about is the SDK 29 update for Android. Um, so as you know, a couple years ago, Google started enforcing that all apps on the Play Store support the um, kind of one back version of Android to the current version. So uh, as of August 1st, that will be Android Q, uh, which we have to support um, for new apps. And in November, all updated apps have to support it, which would include the App Inventor Companion. So our goal is to try to get this deployed by the uh, kind of end of June or beginning of July so that we have time to fix any critical issues that arise before the August 1st hard deadline for new apps. Um, and as part of this, there's gonna be a really sort of big change in App Inventor in the sense that uh, Android also now uses this new system called Android X instead of the old Android support libraries. Um, and that means, of course, that uh, we have to do a bunch of testing related to updating all of the libraries to this new system versus the old system. Uh, the other challenge that this brings up as well is that um, any extensions that relied on functionality in the old Android support libraries uh, need to be migrated. And there's this tool called well, extension developers can do that themselves, but for apps where people aren't necessarily updating their extensions uh, to be in sync with whatever the latest version is, uh, there's a tool that uh, the, um, the Android community provides called Jetifier, which sort of rewrites the class files to use the new APIs instead of the old APIs. And so we're going to we're going to be using this as a shim to sort of deal with the fact that uh, it may not be the case that every extension gets updated right away. Uh, but the goal here is to try to make sure we're not breaking uh, any existing apps um, in a way that would adversely affect users. Now the big challenge with the SDK 29 update is that um, Android Q uh, basically removes support for Within, within a certain context. Uh, it removes support for uh, file access to the SD card, except for in the case where that file access is within an app private directory on the SD card or external storage uh, area. So um, our concern there is that a lot of people may have saved paths specifically to that location in say a tiny DB and that uh, after updating to Android 10, that uh, they may not be able to access those files anymore. Now, uh, Google has provided two flags that we can use, and we're looking to update the build server to support those. Uh, that basically would allow for um, people to, if they upgrade to Android 10, still retain those permissions, uh, in spite of the fact that normally it wouldn't be allowed. Uh, and also that when they update the apps, that the app itself would still retain those permissions. Uh, however, once you uninstall and then reinstall the app, all that, um, all that information is lost. So um, the goal here is we're gonna try to design and update the uh, media util and file util APIs, which is primarily where most of the file access is routed through to, um, to compensate for this and try to do it in a sane enough way that it shouldn't break any apps. Um, but uh, as always, we really would appreciate the community's help uh, in testing that once we get to the stage where we are ready to deploy it to AI to test. Um, is Pavi on the call? I don't think so. So uh, Pavitra, who's one of the members of the Kojula team, is also helping with that. He's uh, working on contributing back some of the Jetifier support uh, and other things to the build server. So we're really uh, appreciative of him taking on that effort. So um, I guess before I go on, are there any questions about the SDK 29 update based on what I've shared so far? Okay. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to cover, which is obviously a big one in the community uh, and still an ongoing question is uh, iOS support. Um, 
so just as a status update, uh, we're in the process of implementing dictionary support for the iOS companion. Uh, and so hopefully that will be going in either this week or next week. Uh, and then we're gonna push out a new beta version to test flight, uh, as well as submit uh, companion for App Store review. Now we don't know how long it's going to take for us to get through the App Store review process. Um, my understanding is that we may need to make substantial changes to how the companion works uh, based on the reviewer's feedback. And of course that's not optional. So um, as we continue to uh, get information about what changes we need to make, uh, we'll be uh, putting out further beta testing releases. And there may, like I said, if there need to be significant changes, then we will try to kind of keep the community up to date about what's going on there. And then I've also been sort of dabbling with the uh, build system for iOS. And there's sort of a, a three-stage vision here that I have. So the first is that we're planning to put together uh, what I'm calling the ad hoc wrapper package. So it won't allow you to publish your apps through the App Store, uh, but it will allow you to use the ad hoc distribution mechanism under the developer account to deploy your app on up to 100 iPhones, iPads, and I guess in three Apple TVs, but we don't compile against the TV SDK. Um, but this way, people can start distributing apps on the small scale to end users, uh, and it will be a way for us to further get information and feedback about uh, when the uh, the AI component kit works and where it doesn't work and uh, what adjustments we need to make uh, for a future rollout. Now the idea behind the wrapper package is that the apps will still be running in interpreted mode uh, using the scheme interpreter that's part of the companion app. Um, the second stage is to actually move towards compiling those apps by taking the scheme code and outputting LLVM bytecode, which then would go through the standard app compilation process uh, to generate the app uh, file that is packaged into the bundle. Um, so that's a, that's a bigger process because it actually involves doing a lot more work within the ecosystem of the Apple tool chain. Uh, and since that's a constantly moving environment, um, you know, it may be difficult for us to keep up with that, but we're gonna see what we can do. Uh, and then the last stage will be App Store compiled packages. Um, now the challenge here as far as I've been able to work out is that Apple really only provides APIs for updating apps through Xcode. Um, and that usually means logging in with a username and password. I'm looking for ways that maybe we can not deal with that because I don't want people having to reveal their credentials for their Apple logins to MIT in any way. Um, that may come in the form of a package that you need to install similar to the emulator package that would allow you to upload your apps. Um, but our goal is that we do not want to have any sort of app store interface in App Inventor that would somehow rely on people exposing credentials to MIT. I just don't think that's a good way for us to go. Uh, so that's kind of a big question um, of how to address that uh, still. Um, and we're gonna continue doing our research there to understand what the most appropriate way to handle that is within uh, the App Inventor ecosystem. Um, any questions about iOS? I know there's usually quite a bit, so. <laughs> and remember, you're pretty much all muted right now. So if you have something that you would like to ask, make sure to unmute. Okay, um, so the next topic was also kind of a big one, um, mainly because it's been a while since we've done it, but there's a Blockly update that we're working on. I was in charge of managing the last Blockly update, which was done in May of 2017. Uh, so it's getting a little bit long in the tooth at this point. And uh, I've asked Lee, to, uh, who's the newest member of our dev team, to lead that effort. And I thought I saw Lee jump on here, but uh, but basically uh, the goal is to bring in the latest version of Blockly with all of the features and enhancements that it provides. So some feature requests that we've gotten in the past include uh, the ability to add comments to the workspace that are separate from block level comments for documenting code, 
Um, and then there's a new Fields API, which I think Becca did quite a bit of work on. And uh, so that will give us more opportunities to maybe have uh, new types of blocks in App Inventor, which will be really exciting. And then there's also a new rendering pipeline, which is actually going to be probably the bulk of the work of doing our merge, because uh, we've uh, there are features in App Inventor that manipulate the rendering um, system that's currently in the version of Blockly we have, and that all needs to be ported to the new version. Uh, but the sort of expectation here is that it will provide us more flexibility going forward. And Blockly itself is going to be moving to a plugin-based API. And um, that means that potentially a lot of the extensions that we've built into App Inventor on top of Blockly may become plugins in the larger Blockly ecosystem, such as the, the backpack, for example. So um, that is another sort of involved project. Of course, it's all on the, um, the web browser side, which means that uh, ideally it should be a little bit more straightforward than dealing with um, the Google and Apple Play stores, uh, but there are always a bunch of corner cases that are difficult for us to find. Um, so Lee, did you have anything you would like to also contribute around the work you've been doing on the Blockly update? Uh, not really. So the problems we saw yesterday and then has been have been fixed, but there are some new problems. It's like the touch gesture, things like that. I see things that I don't like, and I'm still debugging to see if I can fix it. So you talked that the Google switch to gesture because people are using like mobile phones to create apps or things like that? Uh, yes, so more specifically, um, this is an announcement that Blockly, the Blockly team made uh, in October of last year. So there mm -hmm. used to be uh, three different versions of Blockly. There was essentially the web version of Blockly, then there was an Android and an iOS version. And uh, what they decided to do was basically uh, cancel the Android and iOS specific implementations and opt to use a web view instead. Um, and so they have this touch gesture support to kind of compensate for that. Um, this, uh, a version of it in our current sources. Um, there's been a ton of work done on it in the last three years, obviously. And um, so I know I have done demos in the past of uh, App Inventor on an iPad, for example, mm -hmm. and um, it sort of works, but there are some bugs and I think there's still an open issue around uh, once you do certain operations, I think with mutators, uh, eventually the entire page just seems to stop responding because it gets into some inconsistent state. Um, so they will be testing that we'll need to do on, but as far as I'm aware, I think, you know, 95% of our users are using App Inventor, the web, the web editor on a, a laptop okay. or desktop. Um, oh, okay. There are some who are doing it on mobile, uh, but it's not a large percentage. So it'd be nice to get that working. Okay. So basically it's still like a mouse and keyboard. Yeah, primarily. I mean, it may be possible. Uh, I know there are some Chromebook models that have touch screens. Um, so, and uh, certainly there are Windows so laptops as well. Um, but in, I think in most cases, those actually simulate um, simulate the, the touch events as mouse events. So it, it might be okay. Okay. Um, but yeah. All yeah, right, does anyone? I think it's uh, right now it's just extensive testing. Yes. Yeah. And so as part of that as well, uh, one of the things I've been working on um, and also thanks to Becca for doing a little bit of the legwork on this at the beginning. Uh, I have now a version of App Inventor where when we run the unit tests for the Blockly editor module, it actually produces code coverage information. So we can mm -hmm. get a sense of how much of the code is actually being executed when we do unit tests and make sure that as we write regression tests uh, and these uh, other types of unit tests that we actually are, can be fairly confident that the parts of the system that are critical are, actually, are being exercised in some way. Uh, obviously yeah. it doesn't replace, you know, visual inspection and testing of the 
behaviors um, as they appear on the browser, but it can help us be more confident as we do these larger changes, especially with every block we update. We want to be able to catch broken behavior earlier in the development cycle rather than publishing a production version and finding out a week later that something was broken due yeah. to some corner case that we hadn't previously captured. So, so um, look for that uh, in the coming weeks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the last, uh, well, actually there are two things I guess that I'd like to also cover. Um, Mark, do you wanna maybe share a little bit about the work you've been doing on the undo and redo support? Uh, sure. Um, let me switch to uh, to real life for a second. What is that? That's adorable. Uh, yeah, it's this thing called Lumi, uh, L O O M I E, where you can take a picture yourself, and it will create an avatar for you. Uh, you'll be able to see that it's not a photorealistic avatar. Um, and then they have an app that runs on your laptop or desktop or whatever that uh, listens to your voice and then moves the lips of the avatar. It also does some things like, you know, it makes the avatar kind of nod and do other things to make it look like, uh, uh, like I'm paying attention. But <laughs> it's kind of cool. Fantastic. All right. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. maybe it was actually those gestures with your hand going to your chin were things you were actually doing, no? Yeah, that'd be cool if it did that kind of thing. But on the other hand, they also advertise that it's a way for you to like to do other things and look away and make it appear like you're still paying attention. So, but that could be a mode that they could turn on and off. Uh, but the, uh, the moving of the lips is pretty impressive. They're kind of keeping track of what I'm saying and it's it's reasonably decent. I can but, see it, though it's not yeah. quite convincing. And this is a complete tangent, so please, like, actually yeah, talk about yeah. what you were going to talk about. Okay, yeah, and I'm going to switch back so it's less, uh, maybe less distracting, but maybe less interesting. Uh, so this is the real me. Um, yeah, so I've been working. Uh, there, there was there was a bunch of work done. I guess it was a couple of years ago, two two or three years ago, Evan. Uh, to sort of support real-time collaboration uh, in App Inventor by a student named, who was it, Shinwei? Shinwei Dang, yeah. Shinwei Dang. Um, and uh, and there's, a, there, there's a version, there's a branch of a branch of a branch which supports that and it runs somewhere. Um, but uh, it, although it, seems to support the real-time collaboration fairly well. Uh, its event model is not quite good enough to support things like undo and to, to help uh, do some sort of larger scale conflict resolution with in, in real-time collaboration. Do I have that right, Evan? Yeah, um, that's, that's about right. Yeah, and so, so I've been doing some work to try and bring that stuff up to date and uh, advance it a little bit so that, uh, so that we could support undo uh, and that better conflict resolution. And I've gotten about, I don't know, maybe 80% of the way there. I kind of have the framework for making that work right and I can do undo and redo of um, uh, component moves and property changes. Um, there still needs to be added uh, support for deletion and creation events. Uh, but once that's done, then we should be able to, well, and then if we can get that merged back into um, the, the real live uh, master, uh, yeah. which, which I guess will be somewhat challenging. Uh, but once that's all done, then we should be able to have undo and redo and also be able to improve the real-time collaboration support. Uh, I guess the, the long-term goal is to be able to support both of those things in, you know, in real life, full App Inventor, uh, assuming we can deal with the sort of scalability issues, especially in the real-time collaboration support. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah, thanks, Mark. 
Yes, sure. and uh, along with undo and redo uh, capabilities, uh, another sort of editing feature that um, is in the, the pipeline uh, right now is um, I implemented support for cut, copy, and paste operations in the design view. Um, for those of you who've been playing with App Inventor for a while, of course, you know that uh, the blocks editor, when we did the last Blockly update, added support for undo, redo, and cut, copy, and paste. Um, and so this will kind of bring the designer piece of it in sync with that functionality. So uh, between the cut, copy, and paste support plus marks, undo, and redo support, uh, we'll have um, much more sophisticated editing capabilities within the App Inventor user interface, which will be really good. Uh, and then the last uh, topic that I just wanted to officially kind of go over is Google Summer of Code. So um, Google announced the, um, the students and the projects on Monday, um, 2 p.m. Eastern time, and a number of the students are here. So congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, you. this is our biggest team and it's great and we are really, really excited about it. Yeah, so Susan Susan has been um, the person in charge of administering all of the Google Summer of Code stuff. So you'll get lots of messages from her over the next couple months. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> um, but I just wanted for the students who are on, um, if you'd like to maybe just give a brief introduction of yourselves and the project you're working on, you know, doesn't have to be more yeah, than a minute. And if and if you don't mind, could you turn on your camera for a sec so we can see see you speaking and see what you look like? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go in alphabetical order. So Becca, you're first. Okay. Let me figure out how to. There we go. Video. Uh, hi, hi. I'm Becca. Hi. Um, I'm going to be working on the blocks editor portion of App Inventor to try and add. Um, drop down blocks to certain properties of components so that it's uh, currently you have to like drag out numbers and uh, put in constants for like uh, alignment and things like that. So we want to try and make that easier for users. Terrific. Thank you. All right. And um, uh, next is Diego. I thought I saw Diego on the call earlier. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there he is. Hey. Uh, your audio is. Diego, Diego, your audio is not on. Yes, it is. But, well, you're not. Well, you're not we muted. Can't hear we you. can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Diego. Oh, there we go. I've, been, oops, I've been in Abbey Mentor for over six years now, and I will be adding other type of bundles to App Inventor that they will allow to build apps as .aav files, which can be distributed through Google Play Store as an alternative to Android, Android packages. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Uh, and then next we have Hamani, and I'm seeing that it says connecting to audio for her right now. Um, so we may need to we may need to come back to Hamani uh, once her audio reconnects. Nope, oh, Hamani, are you there? Hmm, okay. Um, we'll try. We'll try her again. Is Pavi on the call? Yeah, Pavitra. Hello, Pavitra. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yes. Yes. We can hear you. Yes. So, uh, what's going on? Uh, so we're just doing a brief overview of your GSOC project. Oh, um, I'm working on uh, visual, visual component extensions, uh, which is going to uh, enable extension developers to uh, develop uh, visible component extensions, which is uh, quite useful. And uh, it is something uh, which we all wanted uh, since years, and uh, uh, it is quite useful also. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, the extension, visual extensions functionality is one of the oft requested things. So, uh, you know, it will be really good to see that finally make its way into App Inventor. Um, obviously, we've had non-visible extensions for quite a while now. And what, that was also a Google Summer of Code project um, back in 2015, 16, something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's a really great project to see. Um, and then Sarah, do you want to talk about the, the menus work that you're planning to do? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, I am Sarah, and I'll be working on menu components and sidebars. I'll be implementing a menu and and also adding limiting sidebar and Yeah, so the audio there was, a, at least on my end, was a little bit jumbled up. Um, but just to kind of summarize uh, Sarah's project. Um, so there's a, a number of features that have kind of come into the Android sphere in the uh, the last you know five years or so, including um, the floating action button, which can provide sort of in-context menus. Um, and then there's sort of the standard stuff around the, the drop-down menu in the top right uh, under the action bar where people have asked for some time if they'd be able to customize those. And so um, this will kind of allow people to develop more polished apps um, that just appear more professional. And so that'll be really great uh, for, for end users. Um, and then uh, Suyash. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, so, so I'll be working on a tab arrangement. I'll be adding a new component. Uh, tab arrangement. So uh, currently it can be implemented with a uh, horizontal arrangement and a few buttons and uh, some functionality like uh, when we click a button, other, other buttons uh, can uh, get faded out. So we can implement uh, that like that, but uh, I'll be uh, I'll be using the core Android uh, feature, the the tab arrangement, the tab layout provided with Android. So yeah, I'll be adding that uh, tab arrangement. Great. Um, and then I've seen Hamani coming and going. Hamani, are you there? No, no, she must be having some network challenges. That's all right. Um, uh, but Hamani's project, she is going to be implementing uh, theme preview design. Um, so as you all know, oh, well, Hamani, are you there? OK. Um, so, so she's implementing theme preview design, uh, you know, especially now that we have the iOS version, uh, hopefully uh, coming out soon. Uh, people will be able to want to see what their app will look like both on Android and on iOS. Um, as well, within the iOS sphere, uh, or rather the Android sphere, you have sort of different styles and themes of that have come out on Android over uh, its lifetime. And so we continue to have the sort of classic theme, which is pre-Android 3.0, um, and that's the default for now. Uh, but when you switch to device default theme, uh, we sort of want to be able to show people what would you see on different versions of Android, um, or it, what would you see if you're running your app on iOS so that the WYSIWYG nature of the uh, designer more accurately reflects the actual experience you would have on the, the phone or the tablet. Um, and so that's going to be a really intricate change because it's going to affect a lot of different components. Um, but it'll be really exciting to see that so that uh, as people are developing their apps, they have a better feel for how the app is going to appear to end users. Uh, mostly because, you know, usually you have one device and you don't get to experience what other people might be experiencing easily. Um, so this will give them uh, sort of a chance to to get that initial taste of how their app will appear under different versions of Android and iOS. Um, so that's sort of the end of the formal agenda of things that I was planning to present today. Um, at this point, if anybody has any general business of things they'd like to discuss or questions for me or the rest of the development team, um, 
you know, we're happy to to take them now um, or uh, anything, uh, any advice maybe for those of you who are just starting off on Google Summer of Code. Uh, if you have questions about the process, uh, we're happy to answer those now. Um, I was wondering about the timeline for the Blockly update. Like, do you guys have an estimate or are you still sort of like feeling out how long you think it's going to take? Lee, do you want to take that first? Um, I think if we want to, we can upload we can upload the pull request right now, so people can work on it. I think it basically the basic function is working right now. The left, I think, what's left is a uh, testing and then fix issue doing you know along the call. Okay. That's awesome. I'm just really excited about it. <laughs> so that's why I was wondering. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the big thing is, um, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done on core over the past couple of years. And so just kind of bringing things more into sync so that we can have discussions with the broader Blockly community and not feel like we're really out of date. <laughs> Although the impression I got yeah, and Mark and, and Becca, maybe you can uh, comment as well, but at the Blockly Summit, Rachel, who's the uh, the technical lead for um, the Blockly team, she she asked people, you know, to raise their hands if they were, you know, one year out of date, two years out of date, etc. And there were people who were more out of date than us, so <laughs> I don't I don't feel too bad necessarily. Um, but it's a big ask, especially due to all the modifications that we make to Blockly in particular to support uh, functionality with an app inventor. And also because of sort of the storied history between uh, Blockly and App Inventor itself. So um, I guess for those of you who don't know that, uh, Blockly was originally being developed internally at Google to be the Blocks editor for Google App Inventor. And then when Google App Inventor was shut down, uh, Neil, who's the person who started uh, Blockly, he worked on it basically took vacation to work on it to get it to the point where it was a standalone product, uh, not tied to App Inventor at all. Um, and then App Inventor was basically the first major project to use it when it was at, uh, when after App Inventor came to MIT. So, um, and then we also have a number of people, uh, Lynn, for example, who has contributed a number of features to our blocks editor and is responsible for how both um, variables and procedures work in App Inventor among other things. Um, so there's uh, quite a history of Blockly development here at MIT. And then of course, uh, there's the Scratch team too, which is doing a ton of work on Blockly. So uh, any other questions? No? Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for attending this online meetup uh, for Q2 of 2020. Um, we don't have a fixed date yet for the next meetup, but my sort of expectation right now is that we'll plan to do it sometime in uh, mid-August with the goal that the Google Summer of Code students will be able to give presentations of the status of their projects at their time and have an opportunity to share all the great work that they've done over the summer. So I'd really like it all if we get to see you back here uh, in August to see the projects. So thank you everyone. And wherever you are in the world, have a good day, good night, uh, et cetera. And everyone stay healthy. Indeed. Bye everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.